Want to create VR worlds using an HTML-like language? Janus VR may come to your rescue, so let's get to it. You are listening to the How to Create VR podcast, weekly conversations with VR and AR professional creators, designers, and producers. Hello and welcome to another episode of the How to Create VR podcast, where I speak with professional creators, designers, developers, and producers who work on VR, AR, and MR projects. I'm Marcelo Lewin, a VR and AR developer, evangelist, and the guy behind HowToCreateVR.com. My guest today is James McRae, the CEO and co-founder of Janus VR, a software company building technology to bring immersive experiences to the web. Today, James and I will be speaking about Janus VR, Janus Markup Language, and Web VR. But before we begin our conversation, I would like to thank my good friends at VR VR for sponsoring this episode. Thanks to their support, I'm able to continue to create great content to share with you. VR VR allows you to easily share your 360 degree photos and videos with the entire world. Plus, they now have a VR experience that lets you build 360 degree tours easily. You can access VR through the web, mobile, and all major VR platforms. You can check them out at howtocreatevr.com slash VR VR. Make sure you use this URL so that they know I sent you there. James, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Marcelo. I know you're in Toronto, you said, right? That's right. Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Nice. There's a lot of people in Canada doing VR. What's the deal with that? I guess Toronto is sort of one of those national tech hubs. We've got a couple of strong universities here for computer science. Yeah, I guess, you know, Toronto is kind of like a Canadian landscape for startups as well. Well, you're the CEO of Janus VR, so why don't you give us a little background about yourself, how you got into VR, what you do. A little on my background. Currently, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Janus VR. I am a PhD graduate from the University of Toronto here, and I studied computer graphics and HCI. So my work has been in the areas of like real-time graphics, 3D navigation and interfaces, geometric modeling, shape perception. And I guess a couple of the projects that I worked on during those years turned into products and later companies. Throughout my years of study, uh, VR became a huge interest. So, I mean, within my the academic realm in the lab that I was at, the DGP or Dynamic Graphics Project Lab, gave me access to lots of cool tech, stereoscopic displays, motion capture systems, and all these things. I guess my first sort of genuine experience, you know, with just like a, you know, a VR headset that I had on my own and sort of as a separate hobby was this experience with Oculus and the DK1. So as I was working on my PhD, Oculus was kind of concurrently emerging as this dominant player in the space, basically re kind of recreating and getting, you know, a community of people excited about the space again. I guess my first memorable demo experience was this Tuscany demo. I don't know if you remember back then, this pretty simplistic demo, you're just you know, standing in this Tuscan villa and you kind of walk around, look at things. Even then, it was really emotionally impactful for me because you could just see that this was like an excellent exemplary demo of amazing technology. And this, you, you could just sense this coming technological wave. So that was impactful. And is that what convinced you to get into actually creating VR? I guess what I saw there was like a baseline level of quality for experience that like, you know, VR was at a point now where it felt good enough or, you know, the potential was just so obvious that it just got me extremely eager to get started. I would attribute part of my interest in VR as having studied computer graphics, just this idea to take you know, in the real time sense, especially, you know, the, you know, the effort that you put into, you know, creating images and pixels on screen and kind of allowing you to do something a little bit more with them and making those, you know, pixels represent a, an, an object or something that, that could plausibly exist that fools the senses, you know, you feel a bit like a magician, even just, you know, generating a cube, because it feels like this real object brought forth before you. So it made computer graphics seem like, you know, almost like arcane wizardry, where I could, you know, create all manner of experience, felt like magic. It really is like magic, right? And people say that all the time when they get into a VR experience and they've never done it before. When they get out of it, uh, at least my experience with those people, it's like, my God, this is, this is incredible. It's like magic. I mean, they literally use that word. That's obvious why when you experience it, right? Yeah, definitely. So what's your favorite VR experience today? I'm kind of a Bethesda fanboy as of late, so I love these like open world style games. So I guess my go-tos are things like Skyrim VR, Fallout 4 VR. Maybe that's not a particularly interesting answer, but I love that stuff. I guess that said lately, Beat Saber is kind of a current 
recent favorite. Uh, it's, it's easy to just jump in. It's great to play in like a small group. You get a little bit of exercise. And it kind of reminds me of I, I was big into Dance Dance Revolution back in the day, <laughs> like 90s. So it's like DDR for VR and stuff. And I'm recently married. My wife loves this game too. So it's I'm just having a blast with that right now. Yeah, we just had a hackathon in my work and we brought some VR gear and the most played game was Beat Saber. It's a totally cool game. Yeah, it's easy to, like you said, it's easy to get in, easy to get out, and you feel, you experience VR. And by the way, congratulations on just getting married, too. Uh, oh, man, you know, playing Beat Saber, you know, some of those box config, those, those collidable boxes can provide some tight configurations at room scale. So it's quite an amazing thing to see the range of flexibility a very now pregnant woman can have and like ducking under some. It's, it's like, you know, watching art, like acrobatic maneuvers and stuff. It's, it's a great exercise. Delightful. Yeah, indeed. All right. Well, let's jump into Janus VR. Am I, am I pronouncing it right, by the way? Janus VR? Yeah, you know, the actual Roman god's name is Janus. That's the formal definition. But I've been calling it Janus so long. And so what is what is a name? And I guess I took some sort of liberal uh, changes there in pronunciation. But, you know, either way, I know what you're talking about. So I, maybe I'm it's a Canadian fun. versus American pronunciation. Yeah. <laughs> let's keep it that C way. C and Z type thing, right? Right. Yeah. Exactly. C and Z. <laughs> right. So give us an overview of Janus VR or Janus VR. Genesis VR is a platform for creating virtual reality experiences. Notably, these are experiences that I guess, live on the web and can be experienced together in groups. We as a company have created a few core pieces of technology to make this possible. So the first, as you alluded to earlier, was, was JML, our markup language. So it's, it's similar to, you know, I think if you've harkened back to the days of VRML or these other declarative XML-based languages, these effectively define, you know, the content of the scene and can also be combined with JavaScript to have more, you know, dynamic experiences. So there's the JML language, and then we have the Janus clients, which are, you know, native applications that are functionally equivalent to web browsers that let you browse the web, but these digest JML content specifically. Now that said, we also have a web VR based client called Janus Web, which is essentially allowing you to access Janus VR experiences in VR using traditional browsers like you know, Firefox, Chrome, and you know, WebVR-enabled browsers. We also have server-side technology that allows users to interact, you know, collaborate, do things together in real time, support custom avatars, gestural information, head and hands, and so on, voice, all that. And then we also have Vesta, which is our, our content and hosting platform. I guess we use it also as a platform to allow people to discover you know, the same way you, you, one might search with Google on the web. But in addition to that, it also contains, you know, like almost Facebook-esque sort of social, a social layer to allow like, you know, spatial commenting and thing between viewers and on and on. I can talk a little more about that. Aside from all that, we also have a collection of tools and plugins that allow people to bring content onto our platform using a variety of software just to get like, you know, Maya, Unreal, Unity, SketchUp, a range of tools just to be able to import, bring that content in. So it's essentially a complete platform, I would call it. And there are all of these kind of components that were necessary to build to, you know, bring this larger vision if you step back of this immersive web to light. So it sounds like you've got three core pieces, right? One is the the building, the creation part, which is that JML and the infrastructure behind that to create the world. Then you have the players to be able to consume it. And then you have the distribution, which is your Vesta hub, I would assume. Yeah, in terms of order of like you know, prioritization, I guess those are the three most major elements. Right, then you can break it apart into further. So this sounds very familiar to WebVR and you know what's happening there. So let's talk about, well, first of all, let's talk about who's the target audience for, for JML and, and Janus VR. You know, the target audience for JML, I, I kind of had a clear vision from the beginning that I wanted to create, give people the ability, the power to build simple, immersive experiences and have these highly accessible, highly shareable. So bringing these, these, these to the web and using open web standards seemed like the most obvious approach and intuitively the correct solution. So originally the first iteration was, you know, a native client across platform, you know, it runs on different operating systems, but a separate client. And I kind of realized in, in hindsight, and I guess as the industrial landscape matured with the advent of proposed standards like WebVR and so on, we could also have a WebVR based client. So the original native clients were there to support, you know, essentially a need that hadn't existed yet. So People have the option to build, however, but really the target audience, again, 
are just those who are interested in creating these simple experiences and, you know, versus having game engine development specifically, having knowledge of basic web development, which I think casts a much wider net, people who can hack a little bit of HTML, you know, we, that's our target audience. So like more web developers or quote unquote power users, let's say. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about the relationship between what you are doing and WebVR. Is it competing with WebVR? Does it use WebVR as the pipeline to be able to access the HMDs through the web? Can you explain that relationship? The JML exists independently of WebVR. And I mean, these are kind of different concepts, or I guess functionally serve different purposes. So JML is like a declarative language that lets us define the content of an immersive experience. You know, that content can be accessed through a variety of clients. One of those clients if you call it as Janus Web, and that works within a you know Web VR supported browser. So Web VR is kind of a separate standard, a JavaScript library that basically gives you the hooks to interface with VR headsets and so on. But that's happening kind of at another layer. So if you're using Firefox or Chrome or one of these Web VR supported browsers, you know that's kind of further down the stack. That's going to allow the interoperability with the browser. And then you know from there through something like 3.js and then finally Janus Web. You know, it's, it's, it's a hierarchy or, or sort of a, a stack of technology. Right. So it would be more comparable to, let's say, A-Frame? Yes, yes. So something like A-Frame or React 360, yeah. Or React 360, right. So what's the relationship there? So would a developer, let's say, I want to go ahead and start creating a world. Can I use JML to start creating the world and then add some A-Frame or React VR? Or am I going to pick one of those to actually do this? In other words, I guess my question I'm asking is, as a developer, why would I pick JML versus, let's say, A-Frame or React? Which is the same question I can ask about why A-Frame versus React, right? I mean... Right. So, JML is an alternative. You know, I don't, I, I, I don't see it as a, it's a competitor or anything. Like It's an alternative declarative language. So, in the order of history, at least how it was presented publicly, I guess JML existed for some time prior to A-Frame. So, clearly... JML wasn't designed to like, you know, uh, compete or necessarily interoperate with A-Frame, which didn't yet exist. I don't know if the reverse is true from Mozilla's point of view, but at the time when I kind of proposed JML, this is the time when the company was essentially, you know, one or two man project. It was just a, a definition of a language that was inherently very simple. You know, perhaps with A-Frame, there were separate conceptual plans for it. So maybe there was no, I guess, attempt to reach out and kind of extend JML because they do sort of a similar purpose, right? That said, though, you mentioned the bridge between JML and A-Frame. So company-wide, anyways, one of our, you know, our initiatives or things we've been working on, I guess we do a lot of experimental sort of things, is to just add interoperability between JML or the Janus clients and any immersive content on the web written in any other language. I mean, we're really language agnostic. The last thing we're doing as a company is, is sort of fighting a language war or something like that. I'm, I'm very agnostic to the underlying language in some sense. So what we've been trying to do, though, is, is create experiences. And we actually already have example demos of this. Maybe I can send you links later. But web VR experiences that maybe you begin in a, you know, a Janus environment, and then we have a link or portal that actually provides a view into an A-frame experience. So essentially, this is, you know, an A-frame experience separately loaded onto like, you know, a canvas or rendered to texture, but that loads inside sort of the Janus environment, but provides you a window you know, the goal being this sort of seamless transition between, you know, a, a JML authored room and an A-frame authored room. So what we have now are kind of these links or portals that provide this window and once clicked kind of, you know, the URL, you know, move, takes the client to the next URL. But rather than just these discrete jumps, I'd love to see this seamlessness and transition or just, you know, the ability to mash together these languages. That would be brilliant. But we're not there yet. We're probably at the same point that the web was 10 years, 15 years ago, right? I mean, things are starting to pop up and then hopefully things will consolidate. There'll be standards. So is your long-term goal to make JML a standard? I mean, what's your long-term goal for the company? And the reason I ask is because as a, as a developer, we need to pick something that we're going to focus on, but you don't want to pick something that it won't be there, let's say, a couple of years from now. I'm not saying JML won't be there, but the same thing goes for A-Frame or React. So what's your ultimate goal with JML? Do you want to make it sort of a standard? Do you want to work with a standard body and, and incorporate it into that? I mean, we've never actually reached that level of formalization where we would do that. And that's, I guess that's time. Company culture-wise, we've kind of been in a you know, very experimental, proposing new ideas. I mean, this, this does feel like a new frontier for the web. I guess I'm hesitant to, you know, move forward on 
proposing some formal standard that you know, I would need to adhere to and, and lose that sort of more experimental fun that we've been having in development over the course of the past few years. So, I mean, that said, though, I mean, we do have public documentation. It's an open project in every sense, you know, in terms of the source code access to our clients and server code. But, you know, even the JML spec itself, I'm happy to if anyone from our community comes forward and proposes to make changes or extend it in some ways, we're interested in that. And that said, yeah, I guess as we bring new people onto the team and, you know, gather greater viewpoints and, and, and look at some of the strengths and weaknesses of the JML standard as it is, we see that it really is kind of subject to change. So that said, I guess there are some kind of core definitions of the language that have remained relatively very stable over the, the past few years. I guess, when did, when did I, the initial sort of proposal of JML, quote unquote, get it started? This is like 2014. So, you know, there's much of the language as it were, that's, that I guess has remained somewhat constant throughout all of that time. So, and again, it is open source. So there's no idea of sort of pulling out the rug under anyone that the tools, the software is out there. It's not going anywhere. It's in, it's in the public domain. So having everything open, having liberal licenses for things should assuage that, that fear of, you know, that rug being pulled out. What's your personal opinion on standards? Do you feel that VR is lacking standards? I'm talking about development standards right now, like frameworks, true frameworks that people are adopting. Do you feel like we need to have some sort of standards or like you kind of mentioned right now, right now it's kind of playtime almost? I do. I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, the, the formation of standards allows, you know, I guess a greater degree of confidence beyond the more sort of playful applications you know, moving towards sort of like enterprise class, business to business things, you know, you want to specify, are you using these formal systems who could be held accountable, so on and so forth. So, you know, I obviously see the utility and value of, of, of having those things. And there are these, you know, these, these, these greater bodies, these greater organizations. I mean, within the landscape, we're, we're, we're but one company, but a lot of consolidation tends to be happening. Like, so for instance, WebVR is a fantastic initiative and it's got some of the, you know, the greatest companies in the world, lots of intelligent people working for those companies that define such a standard. But, you know, I guess it is, again, standing on the on, on the shoulders of others. So, you know, to have something like, you know, WebVR and then, you know, one level above that, having the specific 3.js or one of these things, it, you know, it is a stack. It is a set of libraries. So I think that we're sufficiently up that stack that I guess there are plenty of options. And I guess there is no sort of clear, one singular clear winner or emergent, you know, dominant language. It's, it's, it's still a matter of choice and it's and it is still you know even years later still in these uh, experimental phases as i was saying what about ar does jml support ar if not what's your take on ar and what do you want to do with that so regarding ar we, we have done some work there in our company meta is one of the companies that we've collaborated with for instance so we were part of their their beta program and we actually created a custom Janus client for their v2 headset and we had that client working and, you know, we had actually had the basic AR experiences. A Janus environment could be brought into your physical environment and, you know, the you know, physical virtual space was calibrated. So you can picture basically a VR experience, an AR experience, much like the VR experience, but without sort of that skybox or background geometry enabled, you know, allowing reality to sort of bleed through the screen there. So you could have these objects appearing and so on. One thing I'm excited about, and I think you know, technology is going to have to move forward in a number of ways, is this idea of a, uh, you know, these spatialized web pages. I think something that would really make this seem like a necessary thing to have are these spatially contextual web spaces. So, like right now, the the current web lives in this abstract realm of URIs, but to have web pages or spaces that are somewhat think of them as having like physical attachment points like you walk into any environment and there's like an accompanying spatialized web page i mean that's that's an exciting concept to me and that'll be a bigger deal when vrar tech is portable smaller there's really interesting groups that are already looking at this problem i don't know if you're familiar with like this mixed reality service group i'm not okay well i got introduced to this i was in an event here in toronto that was it's like an idea boost event there i actually got to meet Mark Pesh for the first time. So he's actually one of the guys who penned VRML. And he's proposing this idea of it's like kind of basically like think of like DNS, but for geospatial addresses. So instead of like domain name, give me IP, this is like I, I have a GPS coordinate, give me the IP, you know, so bang, you actually get that spatialized web page. And it's 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 sort of geospatially indexed or, or keyed versus being like domain name indexed or keyed. So while it seems all abstract and strange now, and like why spatialized web pages, 
think to the future, think to when AR and these technologies will become prevalent and this technology will be necessary and think of and absolutely any industry in the world which you go to a place will be augmented for lack of a better word by by, by the, the emergence of such technology. So JML supporting AR, I mean, it can in theory, we've done some experiments, but in terms of a product we're rolling out today, sadly, no, but our eyes are on that future. Do you think all of this will merge AR, VR, basically become MR into one HMD that will handle everything? Potentially. I mean, unless there's something that makes the VR experience inherently better from like a hardware technology point, but, you know, maybe this oversimplifies it, but conceptually you can think of, you know, an AR headset as being a VR headset that allows for pass through, reality pass through, right? So one is, one is sort of a subset of the other from a visual point of view anyway. Right. Almost like the Vi Pro. Well, yeah, I guess you buy a camera pass through, whether it's like a two-way mirror style headset or, yeah, anyway, it's just hardware specifics anyways. I guess, yeah, I think that there will be this convergence. We're already seeing that in the in the industry and, you know, they want to name things, you know, XR, mixed reality and kind of collapse all these different definitions together. I, I guess I'm less fussy and less sort of interested in all that, <laughs> more about creating this stuff. The names keep changing yeah, every day. right. Yeah. yeah, what's what's the trendy name of the year or whatever, right? right? I think it's Immersive Web now, no more XR. <laughs> yeah. yeah, everyone's got to be different, right? Everyone's got to differentiate as a company. So it's... Right, exactly. That worries me a little bit because I think we're at a point right now where we shouldn't be doing that. I think we should all be working together. Right now, there shouldn't be this competitive thing. It should be more of cooperating and working together to increase the size of the industry. And then there's going to come a time where, yeah, go and, and try to, you know, bring down your other company, whatever you want to do. But right now, I think everybody should work together so we can all gain in the future as this industry grows. What's your take on that? I believe in that. That's certainly a high ideal to keep in mind. But, you know, the, the reality as a company is that you need to... You know, based on things like runway money, you have people you want to pay and things you need to you need to be able to execute and, 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 and create things today as well. You know, build build value today, you know, with the intention of that panning out or becoming profitable, highly usable for everyone later. We do see that. I mean, companies, of course, do work in isolation. Each have their own projects. Each wants the leg up. But, you know, the, these sort of consortiums, these sort of public working groups and things, I think I think that the right idea, you know, is there. There's sort of this research or these developments that happen in public. I mean, it's which is reminiscent of, you know, the you know the university tradition of, you know, academics coming together and this pursuit purely to, you know, bring bring, you know, human knowledge forward. Similarly, the proposal of standards and, and things people can get behind to you know allow actual work to get done, I, I think is also a high, high ideal. And, you know, as a company, of course, I try to foster that culture of certainly of collaboration. You know, we've, 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 we jump on opportunities to join such working groups all the time, whether it's, you know, Kronos is a big one, you know, proposing you know, GLTF adoption of standards like that, transmission formats, or Web3D is another, another major one. They're really interesting. And they're at SIGGRAPH as well. The VRBA, so, you know, Philip Rosedale with High Fidelity has proposed the Virtual Reality Blockchain Alliance, which, you know, explores, you know, the role of blockchain for, you know, identity, identity management, assets, ownership, all of these sort of interesting concepts. But yeah, as a company, I guess, you know, it, it, it still remains a dialogue with all these other, you know, working groups that collectively propose standards or solutions that, that eventually stick. And that's, that's the idea. That's the hope there. So what are some of the use cases for JML and what are some of its limits where you go, you know, this is this is not what it's meant for? Right. So, I mean, I guess it's been interesting to see all the, the I mean, there's been many creations the community at large has made. I guess the great thing about this, you know, web based language is that there's thousands and thousands of, you know, community or user made content out there. The vast majority of it all is, is, is just made by others who've adopted our tech versus being made in house or something. Some of the most Prevalent use cases we see are things like, you know, 360 and video theaters, museum and tourism like experiences, you know, someone will model their house or something like that. Obviously, you see a lot of these gamify like video game tribute things and like 2D games brought to VR type of experiences. You see lots of these personal or self-expressive kinds of works more on the business oriented side. I guess there's lots of opportunity for, you know, immersive experiences with, you know, real estate. You can do guided tours certainly easily with Janus because we already have all of the, the multi-user and collaborative stuff built in. So, you know, for instance, more on the business side, like uh, Janus, as we as a company, you know, we obviously do our 
company-wide weekly meetings with it to good effect. So, you know, we're able to chat, converse, you know, we can drag and drop or paste in all our different content, show what we're working on, follow each other around the web, exploring, reproduce bugs, all manner of things. Piles of use cases. It's, it's, it's really not focused on any particular vertical. I guess it's kind of as the, as the web is itself, you know, it is, it is what you make it. It can be repurposed to suit the need of your own company. And we really encourage users, companies to, you know, adopt our tech and go, go find that need that they have and go use our, our stuff to, you know, push their own agenda forward. Can you integrate with backend services? For example, let's say Amazon Web Services like S3 or, or a, a backend database to make it fully interactive? There's the JML language and there's JavaScript support. So as you would in traditional web development, you, we have things like RESTful API support. So via HTTP, you can, you know, do GET and POST and, and these different things. So those kinds of hooks are, are, are even baked into the, 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 the Janus client right now. So, you know, in as far as you have a, an, an API that is, that is accessible via such means, yeah, you can, you can have that kind of communication happening with some server. Yeah. And is it responsive? And what I mean by that is if I create something in JML world and I watch it or look at it on a browser, right? Will it just show it to me on a browser? And then if I go to a mobile phone, it'll work there. But if I go into an HMD, it'll also work there. Sure. So, I mean, it is a 3D space. So, I mean, it's kind of inherently unbounded. You inherently don't have the same issue you do have where, you know, there's, there's resolution DPI issues fitting into a viewport, thinking of the physical dimensions of the device and the screen, right? It's a 3D space. So the, I guess the, the benefit or beauty of that is that the 3D content itself can, is, is, is inherently unbounded. That said, I mean, it, it eventually it does end up on a screen or pumping through some kind of a device. There's a pile of ways that that content can be accessed. Uh, you know, mobile devices, even just the class of mobile devices alone. I mean, you can view that you know, in 2D, as it were, just by kind of you know, using the touch screen and looking at it. And that, that's kind of sort of more of a first person perspective or sort of more of a fallback mode of sorts. But then you can put that mobile phone into a, you know, a headset like a Gear VR or cardboard or, or a Daydream more, more modern and experience it stereoscopically. So, I mean, in that sense, responsiveness, you know, one thing we've aimed for is ubiquity to work with all kinds of different HMDs, all kinds of input configurations, keyboard, mouse, gamepad, you know, the controllers that, the little minimal controllers that ship with some of these mobile headsets, all that. The clickers, yeah, yeah. Do you have a, a client for the Go? We do, yes. And actually that released a week or two ago. We're actually getting pretty slammed on the reviews of that Go build. It was slightly rushed, but we did this because we wanted to release the Go build in tandem with the Rift build on the Oculus storefront. We've been available on Steam and on, on Viport and, and on the web and elsewhere for years now, but we finally have done that. But we've been really responsive with the reviews and, you know, the Go build is actually being updated every couple of days as a result of the, you know, the most pressing needs as a result of the community feedback. So, but yeah, if you, if you, if you put the Go on and you just, you can, you can search for Jan's client, grab it right there. So we do have a, an Android port of our native client that's built specifically for the Oculus platform. Now, let's say I start something in JML and I want to finish it off in, let's say, Unity or Unreal. Is there an integration between the engines? So the work that we've done so far to have portability kind of has been so far, our, most of our efforts been in the other direction. Using Unity or Unreal as the authoring or editor platform, you know, creating the scene, creating that configuration, and then kind of a one button press that exports that content into a you know, the JML language makes sure all the geometry is in a portable enough format. So that said, like, I guess a lot of the assets are in somewhat standardized formats, like the geometric formats and other formats, that those could be brought into Unity or Unreal, like piecewise. But no, we don't actually have an importer, but I... But no pipeline into it. And the main reason I ask is sometimes you use technologies like yours to start a prototype, right? Because you can iterate very quickly and then maybe you want to then, you know, take it to a level that maybe you guys don't support for whatever reason, right? Whatever Unity can do that maybe you guys can't. And that goes for web VR in general, right? So starting at, at a web VR or Janus VR level as a prototype, iterate quickly. And once you get to a point, then you can go, okay, take it to Unity and give it to Unity developer to, you know, do whatever else you want to do. That's interesting. I, I haven't yet thought much of that as a use case for it. It's an interesting idea. In theory, of course, this, such a such a plugin could be written. I mean, we already have an export. It's just the, the inverse of that. No, not not to date, unfortunately, no. I've always, I, again, I thought that the Unity Unreal's tools, I mean, they've got really fantastic built-in editors, of course. That's what they do. 
And, uh, you know, rather than try to compete head on with those, if anything, I just would love to have our users be able to utilize those if that's their familiar editor and then bring that content to Janice to make it openly public shareable. Speaking of editors, do you guys have an editor instead of coding, hand coding in JML? Do you have an editor kind of like Unity, but it generates JML in the background? Great question. Actually, I mean, the, the Janus native clients themselves contain all those kind of basic tools for, you know, developing, editing and like debugging the web spaces. So there is a code editor, you know, error logging panels. There's panels that show asset lists, room object lists, object hierarchies, property panels, exactly the kind of interfaces you would expect from an application like Unity Unreal, Amazon Sumerian, for instance. And even on Janus Web, I guess you also get the affordances of the browser you're using, right? You can get the developer window open, hit F10 or whatever, and you know start hacking away in there. So yes, the the the, the editing functionality the baseline is built in. It's actually just a matter of user preference, and us, we just wanting to open it up to allow people to edit however they like. You know, same way you would with the web. Like you don't want to constrain someone to a particular text editor. You want to let them use whatever they like. What about optimization tools? If, you know, I start adding big 3D objects and huge files, will it, do you have any optimization tools that says, hey, you know, some things are not going to work here properly? I mean, we, we try to do what we can, especially on the native client, in order to optimize large models and chunk them out, use modern OpenGL to, you know, get all these buffers filled and, and things populated as quickly as we can. But yeah, that said, I mean, I guess there are External tools can be used to do things like, you know, object grouping or pa texture packing and all of these things. I mean, I'm going really down the graphics path. So that maybe we mean optimization in, in, a, in another way. But, you know, I think of optimization, I think of frame rates is the first thing that comes to mind. But I would say that's at the, that's at the forefront of what we do. And we try to do what we can with our own inbuilt engine to, you know, make it high performance, make it efficient. But yeah, those, those are separate sort of pipeline tools, I would say, that, you know, mesh simplification, for instance, isn't, isn't in the Janus client. Things like level of detail are really, like, baked into it, but I guess one could, in theory, you know, add JavaScript to their room to swap, you know, different geometric instances in and out to you know, improve frame rate and so on. But Dynamically do it, right, right. Finally, and we're almost out of time here, and I really thank you for, and you've been a wealth of information, so thank you for being candid and, you know, talking about all this. Do we have to host it in Vesta or can I create JML, the, the whole world, and then just put it on, on my GoDaddy website and then let people hit it through there or put it on Amazon Web Services, you know, like S3? Absolutely. So I think one thing we had an, an, an edge early on as a company is that I think we offered a publishing platform that offered the highest amount of control to the end user, full control. So you, you're free to host it wherever you like. To be candid, the only reason we made Vesta in the beginning was... For those users who didn't have that, you know, that GoDaddy service or something to turn to, we actually offered free hosting to those users so they could develop environments. But this is any web page. Um, in fact, any any current URL works in Janus. It's not just locked into Vesta content on this Vesta specific server. So content can be hosted anywhere. And indeed it is. You know, a web page or web space in JML can obviously also reference, you know, assets at rem remote URLs or other domains, in fact. So... The content can, can, can in fact be anywhere. All that matters is that it's you know, publicly accessible, HTTP accessible. So I, I think that that's fantastic. And, even, and it even goes beyond just the, where, the, where the content itself lives. I mean, you can run, you have the ability to run your own presence server. That's written in node.js. Feel free to grab, use, extend that. You want to add new types of authentication. You, do you want to enforce certain custom avatars, looks and feels? All that code can be grabbed. You can just run, you know, NPM, run your own Janus server, add that to your markup to specify that's, that's where you want the, you know, the user communication to happen. I mean, highly, highly customizable. It's technology out there for people to, to do as they wish with it. Last question that I ask all my guests is, what would you like VR to be in five years from now? I guess what I'd like to have happen is increased adoption, for one. Amen to that. That would be a, that would be a boon for for all levels. We would we would see more we would see more creation. Companies would flourish. All these great things would happen. I'd like to see more real world relevant applications of the technology. I mean, we're we're seeing a lot of you know games and storefronts and the sort of like first level thing. But I would I'm more interested in the in the deeper things. The the whole platform plays providing a whole platform or like moving in a direction where no one's looking. I mean, people are going to expect games. People are going to expect 
extended software, like three modeling software, where you can look in, you know, your object in VR. I'm really excited to see all the the ways that people aren't thinking about are those sort of less trivial applications or uses of the technology. Beyond that, I guess obvious stuff is like want to see an increase in the resolution, the visual fidelity. You know, we're still magnifying pixels in front of our faces. So I think when we start to hit that like retina class VR, you know, for lack of a better term, just where that angular resolution is sufficient, you're no longer distinguishing these pixels. I think that's going to be a boon for productivity. I'd love to have spent the rest of my life monitorless and just have a headset with the computer, have the computer built into the headset when these things reach that level of scale and efficiency, you know, just redefine computing, how we use these machines. If those devices are made smaller, lighter, more powerful, I mean, I could really see, you know, that I guess that idea of that, that concept we discussed earlier, of these sort of geospatial web spaces, you know, these, these, these websites that live in our reality. I think that's a really exciting future possibility. And I, I see the world heading that way in time if the technology can get there. So I guess that's what I'm most excited about or dreaming about. And I think that if that did happen, that would pave a really wonderful path forward for us as a company too. That's a good answer. Well, James, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. If people want to get a hold of you or want to learn more about JML or in Janus VR in general, do you want to give some URLs, Twitter, email, whatever you like? JanusVR.com. We have a Twitter account. It's official Janus VR. And we're also, we have a subreddit. You can find us on Discord. There's a bunch of different ways, but JanusVR.com. Yeah. Check us out. Excellent. We'll put everything on the show notes. So thank you so much, James. And to the rest of you, I'm glad you were here with me. If you enjoyed this podcast, please remember to subscribe, leave a comment, and like us on iTunes or SoundCloud. For more episodes, check out howtocreatevr.com slash iTunes or howtocreatevr.com slash SoundCloud. If you'd like to watch video interviews and how-to tutorials all about VR and AR, please subscribe to my YouTube channel at howtocreatevr.com slash YouTube. If you are ever in the Southern California area, we have a monthly meetup with lots of great VR and AR presentations. You can join our RSVP for our next meetup at howtocreatevr.com slash meetup. Finally, if you're interested in learning more about how to create VR, AR, and MR experiences, please visit howtocreatevr.com. Until the next episode, I'm your host, Marcelo Lewin. Cheers, everyone.